Hi everyone. So today we'll be talking about Ellington and Ansible and how to leverage it to reduce uh, automation time. So we will start on uh, how EDA can help you. EDA stands for Ellington and Ansible, uh, just to be clear. Uh, how does it work and then some takeaways. Uh, but first, about me, I've been doing IT stuff last 20 years, mostly in consulting slash uh, operations roles, and I started using Ansible in 2013. That was 11 years ago, and at the time Ansible was a very immature project, um, but it really matured over the course of the last 10 years or so. I do work for Red Hat, uh, but I have a very big disclaimer here, which is Everything we are going to discuss today is fully open source. So you can pick it from the Git repositories and do exactly what we are describing here without having to buy any subscription or anything like that. It's fully open source. So I would like to start with something that happened many years ago. Uh, the time of was not an option, so it was not used. Uh, but I think it was very interesting to see. So what happened is that I've been notified one day uh, that the day before there was an outage. And the, the time of getting the system back was considered too long. This was everything I knew at the time. So I started to analyze a little bit what exactly happened why happened, let's you know, figure out what happened and exactly to fix it. So, the, the first thing is that obviously uh, is the beginning of an outage is the system that goes down. In this case, it was the ERP system of the company, which means basically everything went down. And then someone, the one call person, gets a call of uh, from the system, it says, system is down, do something. So, as you can imagine, what does the, the person do? It start to uh, work the issue, try to find the cause, and, and in the end, it decides that it's not really something he can solve, uh, or is not sure how to solve it, at least. So, they open the ticket. And the, the issue also gets assigned to the ERP team, which work is to keep the system up and running. And the person from this team gets the ticket and then uh, solves the issue and then uh, gets the ticket, works the issue, and then also we have the, the system that goes up. That seems fair. Who has seen something similar in their life? Oh, many people wonder why. Well, this is basically how everything works in big enough companies. Now, who sees issues here? Okay, some see some issues. Okay, uh, not everyone. What if I tell you that the whole thing was more than six hours long? Who still does not see any issue here? Okay, no one. Interesting. Uh, I have another couple of information that um, I think are very interesting. Because I was like, okay, that seems like a very long time to fix an issue. I guess that the majority of the time was in that phase. The person that is uh, trying to debug the issue, trying to fix it, my assumption would be that out of the six hours, I don't know, a few hours are there? Actually not. Four minutes, 57 seconds. So that person takes a, uh, sees a ticket. From the moment it accepts the ticket to the moment that the service goes up, four minutes, 57 seconds. Which seems oddly small number of you know, minutes. It feels like this person was exactly aware of what the issue was, and how to fix it. And then, asking around, 
it came out that actually this same issue already happened eight times in the previous six months. So obviously, yes, the person was fully aware on what he's doing because as soon as got the ticket, immediately understood what the problem was and fixed the problem. And the problem was the database that uh, had filled all the, the space. So basically the fix was remove some files from the disk and then restart the database. Now, this does not feel like a good use of six hours. Because as you can imagine, the majority of time was actually in this space, which is someone that had very little knowledge about the system getting the call and then after a while decide to open the ticket, but at that point it's a second level ticket, so I uh, get queued and so on. So event driven can help in those situations. Also in many others as well, but this is a clear example where uh, if a system an automated system was going through that process, it could have solved the issue in four, five, ten minutes, something like that. So it would still be six hours less of the runtime. If we look at the, the, the workflow of such a system, it basically works that we have an event. So we have an event source that would generate an event. Uh, in this case, it would be an event of a services down kind of event and it sends it to EDA. EDA gets the, the event, analyzes the event, it identifies it as a known problem because as we have seen that problem already occurred multiple times in the previous six months, so obviously it was actually a very known problem. And then it triggers the solution. Now, uh, the uh, solution or the automation uh, can be either to report the incident so basically to go back directly to uh, the developer or to remediate uh, the, the issue itself if also the solution is a new solution. And all of this uh, can work across a lot of different platforms and technologies, which is a key part. So if we go a little bit deeper, uh, we have EDA, uh, which is a uh, flexible uh, event-driven uh, automation solution because it, independently from the event source we can still do uh, all the logics and execution afterward. It's friendly uh, with IT systems because uh, working in a lot of uh, different uh, scenarios and having a lot of integration already available as we will see later, uh, this uh, helps you to start directly using it. And B, since it's a software that works and is designed to work this way, uh, it's also uh, robust in its way of working. And the big advantage is that you can reuse your Ansible automation. Now, I've assumed so far that everyone here knows a little bit what Ansible is and what Ansible does. Is there someone that has never heard about Ansible? No? Oh, okay, a couple of people. So basically Ansible is an automation system that uh, is, is using infrastructure as code principles and describes a process or a state of a system in the AMR form. And then you execute Ansible and it will provide you that state. And what you can do with EDA is if you already have your Ansible labels for the usual things you use Ansible for, uh, you can easily trigger those from EDA, so from an event. So effectively in a reactive mode as well. Now, just to give you a couple of examples of common use cases uh, for this kind of event-driven logic. Uh, I have a few, but you know, there are many, but those are like the first few that come up Conversations. The first one is in the networking side uh, for, for ports and routes events. So it's fairly easy from uh, firewalls or, or routers uh, to get information about which ports get pinged or which routes get communicated through. Um, and effectively, from those create events 
and then those events might be uh, useful to, to be analyzed uh, by any DA system. Another example is infrastructure, like the, the one that we have seen before, resource limits is by far the most common one, Sto uh, storage limits is by far more, uh, the most common one for uh, those as well. Uh, so effectively, if you are filling up the disk, you can do something based on that information. And speaking about security, we have IDSs, uh, intrusion detection systems, uh, that can create, or, or they do create events. So taking those events uh, can lead you to, to trigger some automation. And on the other hand, also user creation. User creation is something that should not happen in the majority of systems. Uh, so if you tr see a user that gets created in a system that should not have any user created there, this might be a signal that something off is going on. Applications also can uh, launch events or can have um, logging systems that launch events for them. So if an application crashes or something else uh, like that, you can uh, also create an event and then automate uh, the solution of that Clouds, obviously everything in a cloud generates events. Uh, all clouds have service buses, I think all clouds, majority of clouds at least have service buses, where basically everything that gets done on the cloud, on the cloud status, on your resources, uh, shows up in the bus. So that can be a very good uh, source of those events. And log uh, enrichment is also, I think, a very interesting use case for uh, EDA because the logic is that once something happens, you will want to have a ticket open for that. Now, if a humans open a ticket or if like, your logging system automatically opens a ticket, it might put some information there, but usually it's not that many information. It's only the information that that specific system knows about. Now, what you can do is from there trigger an automation system, an automation playbook that will collect many more information and then attach those to the ticket itself. So the idea is not to solve the issue in this case, but just to enrich uh, that issue so that basically the human that will take the issue will be uh, already aware of all uh, many more information that will have the uh, solution. And if you think about EDA, like many other things, can be used in very simple ways or very complex ways. So there is the idea of a maturity curve that you can start from very low levels on maturity uh, if you have never used ETA, for instance, in your organization, and then move up uh, with more complex uh, scenarios. So, for instance, a very simple case is the one that we have just spoken about, the log enrichment one, because it's fairly straightforward. Every time you get an event, you trigger an automation that gets some context and put it on the ticket. It's also low risk, because Worst case scenario, nothing will be attached to your, uh, to your ticket if something goes wrong. Uh, and in the other hand, it's not risking, it's not doing anything, you know, changing your environment. Therefore, it's not risking the stability of your environment. And then you can go uh, to higher degrees of automation. So, for instance, uh, you can have for very common tickets uh, that you get as a team, you can have some automation there. So I was speaking a couple of weeks ago where uh, a team that was uh, dealing with a bunch of tickets and we analyzed their tickets. And they were like 50% were just to add users to directories, the, you know, to give users the permission to read directories. So that's a trivial thing to fix, uh, and even for them it was trivial. But when it's 50% of your tickets, just that, then why not automate it? And then over time, you can add more and more complex uh, kind of workloads uh, and more complex kind of event. 
So, for instance, uh, one would be that when you have certain change windows, so windows of times where you can actually do changes, you act in a certain way. If you are outside the change window, then you act in a different way. That's an example of something that can be factored in in more complex simulation. And also, you can get events from different sources and combine them to get a more clear understanding of what exactly is going on before taking out, uh, off an automation. You can then also, also provide to your users some self-service kind of uh, automation, like in the ticketing system that we spoke before. If you automatically uh, close the ticket by you know, doing the privilege uh, assignation uh, with the automation, then it becomes basically a self-service portal where people can just go on it, uh, ask for the, uh, the permission, and then some manager or whoever will approve it, and then as soon as it's approved, you can immediately uh, ensure that that person has that right or, you know, in a couple of minutes maybe. And then also you can do more complex things or more weird things like put some AI into it because you know, nowadays if you don't put AI in everything, it's not cool. So, as you can see, there are multiple levels uh, of automation. I would say there is one that is an automate service and response, which is a the very basic level, and then you can do more complex things, and then AI ops uh, compliance as code, operation as code, self service things, and so on, which are like the fancy words that every IT department wants to use, but not really using it. So, how does EDA actually work internally, let's say? There are three different concepts that we need to look into. The first one is sources, second one is rules, and the third one is actions. So, starting from sources, obviously, um, we have many different event sources. There is one that are what I call the common event sources. So, effectively, those are like files, uh, file watch, which means that you are watching a file if that file changes, for instance. Uh, generally, if you are in a systemd based operating system, obviously you would have journaldy with all the logs into it, uh, range, boot checks, uh, but also web books, which is probably the most common one. You basically, uh, EDA exposes a, ser a server with the web books, and then you can call the, the web book uh, with any system that can call the web book. Now, in, if you are in a cloud, obviously, there are some cloud-based uh, integration already available into the, the repository. Uh, there is also a bunch of specific software that have their own uh, integrations. So if you are using any of those, it's easier than to, to use uh, maybe the, the more generic ones. But also the, the nice part is that you can bring your own. So, in Ansible, we have this concept of collections, which is a package uh, that you can easily redistribute and put modules, playbooks, roles, a bunch of uh, various things, but you can also put different sources in there. So, effectively, a lot of other event sources are probably already available, but also you can create your own if you have some custom system that is not supported. And it's very easy. It's uh, usually 20, 50, 100 lines of Python and your site. Now, if you look at how you would define an event source in EDA, this is how it would look like. This is obviously, as the name suggests, a webhook. And we, in this case, webhook only has two parameters, or only needs two parameters actually. One is the host uh, that uh, I can call it, and then the sorry, the bindings uh, where it will uh, the service will bind to, and then the, the port that is the port that it will use. So as you can see, it's fairly straightforward, and if you know a little bit 
about YAML, which I think it's everyone by now because we are all YAML engineers in the end. Uh, this is a list, and the reason is that you can have more than one source also. There is then the concept of event filters because we got the, the event from that source, but probably we want to create those events again. So the advantage uh, of filters is that we can tweak uh, the, the internals of the event. So uh, there are some filters that are already provided. So one is the JSON filter that allows us to add or remove uh, parts to that, that JSON. Usual events are running in JSON because they have to be uh, transformed into JSON uh, before entering EDA. So with the JSON filter, we can go to add and remove fields in that event. Uh, but also, we have the dashes to underscores. There are a bunch of systems that provide dashes, other like more underscores. So we have this dashes to underscore. And by default, uh, all events will go through this insert meta info uh, filter, for instance, and this will add additional meta information about the event itself to the event so that uh, it stays with the event and we are sure that it's always there. And the, one of the nice things is that you can have multiple filters and then they get changed, basically, yeah, in that order that they appear. And also, as for sources, you can bring your own. So, if you need, a, for instance, an underscores to dashes in, instead of dashes to underscore, if you don't find one that is already written by someone else, you can easily write your own. And in this way, as you can imagine, you can really tweak and optimize every type of uh, event source to your needs. Now, just to give you an example, uh, this is the, a couple of filters. The first one is the JSON, and we are going to include the clone URL field, uh, but exclude a bunch of fields. So effectively, we are going to clean up the event so that it will match exactly what we are going to uh, need. And then obviously, the dashes to underscores uh, will replace dashes with underscores. So as you can see, those can be easily chained and will be run after the, um, the, the event is uh, being sourced. Now, going back uh, to this slide, uh, we have then, this was the sources part, now we have the rules and actions. And we are going to look at rules and actions at the same time, because uh, even though all the actions in the end are something slightly different, but rules are where events and uh, actions get connected. So it does make sense to do them at the same time. So rules, uh, EDA uses rules to connect uh, events to, to actions and therefore to decide which actions run. And it does, uh, rules can have conditions, otherwise I don't think it would be a rule, uh, but they can have either one condition or multiple conditions. They can have one action associated to themselves or multiple actions. So as you can see, it's, you know, it's always one or many, one or many, because it's a very flexible system and wants to be able to cater to a different uh, kind of uh, events every time. Now, if we go a little bit deeper into room conditions, uh, the condition uh, can use information from the event itself, so the received events, uh, but also previously saved events within a rule. So effectively, if an event already triggered the same rule, can be re-preferred um, uh, in future runs of the same rule. Uh, but also, longer term facts about the system, so if we are running uh, on a certain system, it will have some facts, and some effects, uh, and we can use those as well. Uh, but also variables provided as parts. A condition uh, can contain one condition, that's the simple option of it, uh, but also multiple conditions, either with all, so that it's an end 
every statement needs to be true, or any, which is your, so effectively any of those needs to be true. And uh, it does support many uh, different kinds of data, so usually it's uh, covered. It's also possible to set some facts here, uh, as well as generate some facts, uh, which I think is a very interesting thing, uh, because it's a, while you are parsing an event, you generate more events, uh, which help you to uh, abstract and concatenate uh, potentially actions. So, if we move to, to the action part, uh, they are YAML, um, and uh, they can be triggered, um, so the trigger can act, the, the pool can, act, can trigger different actions. Um, and one is run playbook. Run playbook simply means run this Ansible playbook. If you already have an Ansible playbook to solve the issue, you just run it. Uh, also, it can run template. So if you are using a double X or a D A A C, uh, you have templates there, which are basically playbooks into those systems, uh, and you can run them uh, directly from EDA. Uh, you can also run a module, so uh, one step, let's say, of an Ansible playbook is called a module. You can directly run a module if that is all you need. And you can also set facts here uh, or create a, a new event for, um, you know, the, to, to, be, to trigger another uh, rule, maybe, or treat the event so that uh, if you are debugging it, all those kind of things, you can see the event. Uh, retract effect, so basically unset effect. Uh, shut down the, the EDA controller itself, which has a lot of uh, asterisk here, because as if there are other rules that are running on the same EDA controller, and they do go down them as well. Uh, but there are cases where it might be useful. Uh, and also debug, which is uh, basically a train. Now, just to give you uh, a couple of uh, examples, this is a very simple example. Uh, we have a condition, in this case, event.outage, so the variable outage within the event is equal to true. And in this case, we just run one playbook, which is renegade outage, and it will fix our outage, hopefully. <coughs> Uh, it, but you can have something a little bit more complex, so for instance in this case we still have that condition of uh, event dot outage equal to, but also we get this unspool as equal to Linux. So and we will act on this only if there is the outage and the, the system is a new system. And in this case we are also going to print, uh, sorry, run the, the playbook as before as well as print the, the event. So as you can see, you can create fairly uh, complex structure of information with this. There is one interesting feature, I think, um, which is throttling. And more specifically, uh, groups, uh, events, uh, so you, you can group a bunch of events based on some attributes. So for instance, all the events that were uh, storage pressure events and came from that specific system. All those would be grouped as one. And based on this grouping, you can then do things with frothing. An example is with um, once within, is only the first time within a, time, a certain time frame that you see that kind of event in that group, then you act. But also, uh, you can also do once after, which means that after that time frame is finished, it counts the number of times that got fired in that time frame, and then it will run knowing how many times it was requested, basically, uh, so that it can act differently. Well, in this specific case of a storage pressure, you would probably uh, mostly work with the first rather than with the second, but it really depends what you're. Automating in that specific moment. 
and uh, time uh, can be from milliseconds to days. So as you can imagine, this can be something like, oh, uh, did I got fired two, three times within, I don't know, two seconds because different system fired me for the same reason? Or, uh, so this is one kind of usage, or the other one is I, in a day, uh, so that at the end of the day, maybe you do something based on something that happened throughout the day. So, um, a small example, uh, well, two examples actually. The first one is uh, with once within. So, the first time within the first uh, the, the five minutes range, uh, that we will get an event that has auto triple through. Uh, for this specific host, um, in uh, this specific code, uh, the, the error code or event code uh, that it gets, uh, then we are going to uh, send this notify out of, uh, run this notify out of playbook. Uh, well, the second example is with the once after, so effectively we are going to wait for five minutes from the first event, collect all the events that are going to happen in those five minutes, and then we are running one time notify outage um, at the end of these five minutes, knowing that, for instance, it got fired three, five, seven, fifteen times in that time frame. Now, rules alone uh, don't really relate to sources and filters that we have since uh, before, so how exactly do they relate and they relate in rule sets? So, rule sets require a unique name. In theory, everything should have a name, so uh, this is a requirement for rule sets. Uh, they have at least one event source, and uh, they have a host uh, indication on which host the, the playbook or the actions will be run upon, and it will have a list of uh, defined rules. Now, rule sets, uh, every rule set runs independently of all the other rule sets within the rule engine. So they will, you will not have spillovers from one rule set to the other. But until you are in the same rule set, it runs as a single piece of code. So events and facts are kept separate uh, for each rule set, but are shared within the rule sets. Uh, and also, uh, you can have uh, rule sets that call uh, other rule sets. So, an example of a rule set is this one. Uh, so, this is a full file. It starts with the uh, dashes as a YAML file should, and it does have the name as we see it. So, the host and the sources. So, uh, we have the same webhook as before. We have incidentally some filters, you might have them or not, depends on also your situation and then your rules. Now, rule sets are stay within rule books uh, and you can have one rule book that contains multiple rule sets. In the same way that you can have a playbook that contains more, uh, more than one play. Uh, and uh, different uh, sources can be set for different plays. No, sorry, for different rule sets. Also, uh, rule sets, as I say, are very are structured in a very similar way as plays, and in the same uh, metaphor, rule books are very similar to plays. So, just to give you an example, this would be a rule book, and we have the rule set number one and rule set number two. So effectively, these rules will apply to this second uh, event source, and those rules, well, there is only one, but if we had more than one, it would apply to this one. If something uh, calls this webhook, the, the, these rules will not see that event. So, some takeaways um, out of this. First of all, triggering automation uh, directly from an event source can lead to way shorter outages because, obviously, 
we can skip at least a few steps of that long chain of before uh, and potentially all of them if we automate directly the, the, the solutions and we have the outage, the effect of the outage, then the automation that fixes the issue and then this is back up. Uh, EDA allows you to trigger ansible automation from many different event sources as we have seen, and if you are already using Ansible, then you probably already have a bunch of playbooks which you can reuse easily uh, from EDA itself. And also, uh, EDA is, in one hand, it has a lot of features, as we have seen, and we have just seen uh, the, the very basic ones, there are much more complex features, but still, it's very straightforward if you look at the YAML code, there are sources, filters, rules, and you know, that's the flow. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.